Well, thanks, Mark, for that lovely introduction. And it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, this is going to be quite a departure from this morning's presentation. And I'm actually going to present no data and no equations. Uh, but I'm going to talk more conceptually about how do we think about precision medicine, precision health, uh, and population health. So there are, have been several big trends in medicine over the last couple of decades. On the one hand, we've had personalized medicine and precision medicine. There are some differences between those. Uh, my understanding is that personalized medicine focused particularly on the genome. Precision medicine takes into account more of the omics, and those have a fair amount of overlap with some distinctive areas of difference. On the other side, we have social and behavioral determinants of health and population health. And again, there's a lot of overlap between those two but there are some differences. Social and behavioral determinants aren't always framed in terms of population health dynamics, and population health has become both a focus on panels of patients that are handled in health systems and also large populations. For me, pop, the idea of precision health is really the intersection of all four of these, and I think this is where the opportunity lies and where we can really make new discoveries that are going to be most useful, not only in the treatment of individual patients, but really changing the career, the trajectories of health for whole populations. So let me start with precision medicine. Precision medicine is based on the genome, and it's, the fun, it's seen as the fundamental contributor to health and disease. But it's built up through the various omics, through the epigenome and trans... Uh, transcriptome, through uh, pro proteomics, uh, and up to cellular processes, and finally you get to organ systems. This gives a fairly clear idea of kind of the bounds of how we think about what kind of data we need to do this. What we have is a somewhat undifferentiated understanding of what would, what's been termed the exposome, which is everything outside of the body. Uh, it's a fairly large, undifferentiated area and has been described in that learned journal, Wikipedia, as encompassing the totality of human environmental, i.e. non-genetic exposures from conception onwards, complementing the genome. That's a huge area of territory. It's large and pretty undifferentiated. It's a little equivalent to the New Yorker's, this is an iconic New Yorker uh, cover showing the New Yorker's view of the rest of the country, where there's a big difference between 7th Avenue, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, well differentiated, and then be west of the Hudson River you have this large geographic mass with a couple of upcroppings that might be of interest. In. Not sure why Nebraska is of interest, but uh, some of the others make some sense. Uh, population health represents west of the Hudson River. We have this vast, undifferentiated area. There might be some interesting things there, but we have no idea what they are. So as I've been working with folks in population health, what's interesting is there's the obverse valuing of data. What's seen as most fundamental is not the most molecular, but the most distal and molar, and that's our, our policies and institutions which work their way through, through social institutions, through neighborhoods and communities, through interpersonal relationships and families, and then through individual risk and risk behaviors. What's important, you'll see these almost touch, but don't quite. And I think our challenge is how do we relate these two triangles of data? Now, I'm going to make a small editorial comment. I hope people will forgive me. Uh, these are based, the way I've drawn it suggests these are equal and complementary. In fact, if you look at what the estimates are of what determines premature mortality, much more is help happening in the exposome than in the genome. And so actually, and it's uh, about, estimated to be about 70 to 80 percent is due to social, behavioral, and environmental exposures. So really, we should draw the triangles like this. But the point I'm making is not really about their relative size but about how do we maximize the connection between them. It's a little like stalactites and stalagmites. They grow separately, but if they can connect, you can get something actually much more interesting. So let me talk about what kind of data might we need to do this. 
Uh, given the importance of the electronic health record, there's a, been a lot of focus on data mining with clinical data, getting data from sensors into the electronic health record from different kinds of um, M, M technology uh, and genetic information. The question is, what social and behavioral data do we need to complement that? The uh, National Academy of Medicine, which used to be the Institute of Medicine, charged a committee with trying to determine what are the basic social behavioral variables that should be in every electronic health record. Right now, most hospitals and health systems do their own, and particularly safety net hospitals are very aware of the importance of social and behavioral determinants. But everybody kind of makes up their own, and then it's hard to actually merge data and do any kind of data mining. So our committee, which was about a third informaticians, a third clinicians, and a third social and behavioral scientists, had the opportunity to think about what's important, how would it be used, both for clinical care as well as for, uh, for research. I will tell you, we had wild discussions. Uh, the clinicians would say, if I have to click on one more thing, I will scream. So you really need to show me that it's useful and important. And then the informaticians would say, and then we have to figure out how to get it into the record and then get it out of the record so it can be used. So we focused on three criteria for choosing what social and behavioral data should be in it, in the electronic health record. One was there had to be evidence that it was related to health, which seems like a good start. Um, the second was that it was actionable, that you don't want to screen for a determinant that you can't do anything about. And the third was that it was available, and that meant that, number one, there was a valid measure of it and that it was in the public domain. So there are some useful measures, but they're not uh, freely available. What we came up with were basically a concise set of eight variables. Four of them are actually pretty standardly screened for already, but they're not screened for in a standardized way. So what we suggested was more on the measurement side. Uh, uh, the others were new variables, and we suggested what brief screening measures there could be for this. If you're interested, this is available on the National Academy website. There was also a New England Journal article that uh, Bill Stead and I published on this. The issue for me is how do we actually then combine these in such a way that they're useful? We really want to maximize that intersection where we can, in fact, use them in relation to the, not only to the genomics, but to the other omics that it may modify we, I, we think of social behavioral variables as both mediators and moderators of biological factors as well as outcomes. So we have very complex models, and we're going to need new analytics that I know many of you in this room are working on. So this really is the bridge to the, the next presentations, which are going to talk much more specifically about some of the social and behavioral factors. But I wanted to really put in a punch for the idea that we, we, we've been basically ships passing in the night between population health and precision medicine. Instead, I think we need to be partners. Thank you.